Hey guys, uh, happy Monday, happy almost end of the book. Uh, I think we have just a few more sections to go. And um, I apologize for the last video being so long. I made the mistake of assuming that I knew what the reading was and and then not look, not checking and realizing too late that I had done two sections of reading. So that was a long video. Um, but I don't think it really hurt um, anything. It just meant that if you watched the video on Wednesday, you were set through the rest of the week in terms of reading. Uh, so, uh, and today I fixed that. So hopefully today's video won't be um, as long. We're reading two sections. We're reading the uh, chapter two, section 10, and then the first section of chapter three. Uh, so that'll be today, and as with the previous couple of lessons that we've done, I'm going to focus us more in on accomplishing the types of skills that we want to accomplish um, for the AP test, which is coming down the chute here pretty quick. So um, let's get started. Uh, like I said, this is chapters two section 10 and chapter three section one we have the same kind of basic questions that we should be thinking about uh his uses of language in the novel his, uh connections ideas that we have in the novel and also uh and real life and also um how fiction is accomplishing uh things that maybe other types of writing uh, couldn't. Now, all of those I think are going to be relevant for the assessment which uh, for the book, which I will be assigning next Tuesday, I think. Yeah, next Tuesday I'll be assigning that. Um, all of those questions will come into play, but also some of the skills that we've been working on for the past week and will continue to work on this week. So what I'd like to do is to, you know, keep these questions in mind, but then also I'd like to point you in the direction of this quote from Steven Pinker in his essay, Words Don't Mean What They Mean. Uh, he says, when people talk, they lay lines on each other, do a lot of role playing, sidestep, shilly shally, and engage in all manner of vagueness and innuendo. Yet at the same time, we profess to long for the plain truth. Such hypocrisy is a human universal. So I want you to look, be on the lookout for, think about what this, how this quote may apply to what we've read in the book already, but also be on the lookout for how this quote applies to uh, what we're going to read today. And just be ready to kind of draw the kinds of connections between the two texts, uh, any kinds of connections that you can between the two texts. So let's get started with the reading. I'll start with uh, chapter two, part 10. When, when he woke, it was the sensation of having slept for a long time, but a glance at the old fashioned clock told him that it was only 2030. He lay dozing for a little while, then the usual deep lunged singeing struck up from the yard below. It was only an hopeless fantasy, fancy. It passed like an April dye. But I, but I look in a word, but a look in a word, and the dreams they stirred, they have stolen my heart away. The driveling song seemed to to have kept its popularity. You still heard it all over the place. It had had it had outlived the hate song. Julia woke at the sound, stretched herself luxuriously, and got out of bed. I'm hungry, she said. Let's make some more coffee. Damn, the stove's gone out and the water's cold. She picked the stove up and shook it. There's no oil, no oil in it. We can get some from old Charrington, I, I expect. The funny thing is I made sure it was full. I'm going to put my clothes on, she said. It seems to have got colder. Winston also got up and dressed himself. The indefatigable voice sat, sang on. They sigh that, that time yields all things. They sigh you can always forget. But the smiles and the tears across the years, they twist my art strings yet. As he fastened the belt of his overalls, he strolled across to the window. 
The sun must have gone down behind the houses. It was not shining into the yard any longer. The flagstones were wet as though they, they had just been washed, and he had the feeling that the sky had been washed too, so fresh and pale was the blue, be, the blue between the chimney pots. Tirelessly, the woman marched to and fro, corking and uncorking herself, singing and falling silent, and pegging out more diapers, and more, and yet more. He wondered whether she took in washing for, washing for a living, or was merely the slave of twenty or thirty grandchildren. Julia had come across to his side. Together they gazed down with a sort of fascination at the sturdy figure below. As he looked at the woman in her characteristic attitude, her thick arms reaching up for the line, her powerful mare-like buttocks protruded, it struck him for the first time that she was beautiful. It had never before occurred to him that the body of a woman of fifty, blown up to monstrous dimensions by childbearing, then hardened, roughened by work till it was coarse in the grain like an overripe turnip, could be beautiful. But it was so, and after all, he thought, why not? The solid, contourless body, like a block of granite, the rasping red skin, or the same relation to the body of a girl as the ro uh, of a girl as the rose hip to the rose. Why should the fruit be held inferior to the flower? She's beautiful, he murmured. She's a meter across the hips easily, said Julia. That is her style of beauty, said Winston. He held Julia's supple waist easily encircling by his arm, encircled by his arm, from the hip to the knee to the knee her flank was against his. Out of their bodies no child would ever come. That was the one thing they could never do. Only by word of mouth, from mind to mind, could they pass on the secret. The woman down there had no mind. She had only strong arms, a warm heart, and a fertile belly. He wondered how many children she had given birth to. It might easily be fifteen. She had her momentary flowering, a year perhaps of wild rose beauty, and then she had suddenly swollen like a fertilized fruit and grown hard and red and coarse, and then her life had been laundering, scrubbing, darning, cooking, sweeping, polishing, mending, scrubbing, laundering, for the first children, then for the grandchildren, over thirty unbroken years. At the end of it, she was still singing. The mystical reverence that he felt for her was somehow mixed up with the aspect of the pale, cloudless sky, stretching away behind the chimney pots into, in, into in, interminable, interminable distances. It was curious to think that the sky was the same for everybody in Eurasia or East Asia as well as here, and the people under the sky were also very much the same everywhere. All over the world, hundreds of thousands of millions of people just like this, people ignorant of one another's existence, held apart by walls of hatred and lies, and yet almost exactly the same. People who had never learned to think, but were storing up in their hearts and bellies and muscles the power that would one day overturn the world. If there was hope, it lay in the pearls. Without having read the end of the book, he knew that the, that must be Goldstein's final message. The future belonged to the proles, and could he be sure that when their time came, the world they constructed would not be just as alien to him, Winston Smith, as the world of the party? Yes, because at the least it would be a world of sanity. Uh, where there is a equality, there can be sanity. Sooner or later, it would happen. Strength would change into consciousness. The proles were immortal. You could not doubt it when you looked at that valiant figure in the yard. In the end, their awakening could, would come. And until that happened, though it might be a thousand years, they would stay alive against all the odds, like birds passing from body to body the vitality which the party did not share and could, could not kill. Do you remember, he said, the thrush that sang to us that first day at the edge of the wood. He wasn't singing to us, said Julia. He was singing to please himself. Not even that. He was just singing. The birds sang, the proles sang, the party did not sing. All around the world, in London and New York, in Africa and Brazil, and in the mysterious forbidden lands beyond the frontiers, 
in the streets of Paris and Berlin, in the villages of endless Russian of the endless Russian plain, in the bazaars of China and Japan. Everywhere stood the same solid, unconquerable figure, made monstrous by work and childbearing, toiling from birth to death and still singing. Out of those mighty loins a race of conscious beings must one day come. You were the dead, there uh you were the dead, theirs was the future. But you could share in that future if you kept alive the mind as they kept alive the body and passed on the secret doctrine that two plus two make four. We are the dead, he said. We are the dead, echoed Julia dutifully. You are the dead, sent an iron voice behind them. They sprang apart. Winston's entrails seemed to have turned into ice. He could see the white all around the irises of Julia's eyes. Her face had turned to a milky yellow. The smear of rouge that was still on each cheekbone stood out sharply, almost as though unconnected with the skin belief. You are the dead, repeated the iron voice. It was behind the picture, breathed Julia. It was behind the picture, said the voice. Remain exactly where you are. Make no movement until you are ordered. It was starting. It was starting at last. They could do nothing except stand gazing into one another's eyes, to run for life, to get out of the house before it was too late. No such thought occurred to them, unthinkable to disobey the iron voice from the wall. There was a snap, as though a catch had been turned back, and a crash of breaking glass. The picture had fallen to the floor, uncovering the telescreen behind it. Now they can see us, said Julia. Now we can see you, said the voice. Stand out in the, in the middle of the room, stand back to back, clasp your hands behind your heads, do not touch one another. They were not touching, but it seemed to him that he could feel Julia's body shaking, or perhaps it was merely the shaking of his own. He could just stop his teeth from chattering, but his knees were beyond his control. There was a sound of trampling boots below, inside the house and outside. The yard seemed to be full of men. Something was being dragged across the stones. The woman singing had stopped abruptly. There was a long rolling clang as though the washtub had been flung across the yard and then a confusion of angry shouts which ended in a yell of pain. The house is surrounded, said Winston. The house is surrounded, said the voice. He heard Julia snap her teeth together. I suppose we may as well say goodbye, she said. You may as well say goodbye, said the voice. And then another quite different voice, a thin, cultivated voice, which Winston had the impression of having heard before struck in. And by the way, while you are on the sub while we are on the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Something crashed onto the bed behind Winston's back. The head of a ladder had been thrust through the window and had burst in the frame. Someone was climbing through the window. There was a stampede of boots up, up the stairs. The room was full of solid men in black uniforms with iron-shod boots on their feet and truncheons in their hands. Winston was not trembling any longer. Even his eyes he barely moved. One thing alone mattered. To keep still, to keep still and not give them an excuse to hit you. A man with a smooth prizefighter's jowl in which the mouth was only a slit paused opposite him balancing his truncheon meditatively between thumb and forefinger. Winston met his eyes, the feeling of nakedness which with one ha one's hands behind one's head and one's face and body all exposed was almost unbearable. The man protruded the tip of a white tongue, licked the place where his lips should have been, and then passed on. There was another crash. Someone had picked up the glass paperweight from the table and smashed it to piece pieces on the hearthstone. The fragment of coral, a tiny crinkle of pink like a sugar rosebud from a cake, rolled across the mat. How small, thought Winston, how small it always was. There was a gasp and a thump behind him, and he received a violent kick on the ankle which nearly flung him off his balance. One of the men had smashed his fist into Julia's solar plexus, doubling her up like a pocket ruler. She was thrashing about on the floor, fighting for breath. Winston dared not turn his head even by a millimeter, but sometimes her livid, gasping face came within the angle of his vision. Even in his terror, it was as though he could feel the pain in his own body, the deadly pain which nevertheless was less urgent than the struggle to get back her breath. He knew what it was like. 
the terrible agonizing pain which was there all the while but could not be suffered yet because before all else it was necessary to be able to breathe then two of the men hoisted her up by by knees and shoulders and carried her out of the room like a sack winston had a glimpse of her face upside down yellow and contorted with the eyes shut and still with the smear of rouge on either cheek and that was the last he saw of her he stood dead still no one had hit him yet thoughts which came of their own accord but seemed totally uninteresting began to flit through his mind he wondered whether they had got mr charrington he wondered what they had done to the woman in the yard he noticed that he badly wanted to urinate and felt a faint surprise because he had done so only two or three hours ago he noticed that the clock on the mantelpiece said nine meaning twenty-one but the light seemed too strong would not the light be fading at twenty-one hours on an august evening he wondered whether after all he and julia had mistaken the time had slept the clock round and thought it was twenty thirty when really it was nine not eight thirty on the following morning but he did not pursue the thought further it was not interesting there was another lighter step in the passage mr charrington came into the room the demeanor of the black uniformed men suddenly became more subdued something had also changed in mr charrington's appearance his eye fell on the fragments of the glass paperweight pick up those pieces he said sharply a man stooped to obey the cockney accent had disappeared winston suddenly realized whose voice it had it was that he had heard a few moments ago on the telescreen mr charrington was still wearing his old velvet jacket but his hair which had been almost white had turned black also he was not wearing his spectacles he gave winston a single sharp glance as though verifying his identity and then paid no more attention to him he was still recognizable but he was not the same person any longer his body had straightened and seemed to have grown bigger his face had undergone only tiny changes that had nevertheless worked a complete transformation the black eyebrows were less bushy the wrinkles were gone the whole lines of the face were seemed to have altered even the nose seemed shorter it was the alert cold face of a man of about fifty and thirty five, five, about, of about five and thirty it occurred to winston that for the first time in his life he was looking with knowledge at a member of the thought police chapter three he did not know where he was presumably he was in the ministry of love but there was no way of making certain he was in a high-ceilinged windowless cell with walls of glittering white porcelain concealed lamps flooded it with cold light and there was a low steady humming sound which he supposed had something to do with the air supply a bench or shelf just wide enough to sit on ran around the wall broken only by the door and at the end opposite the door a lavatory pan with no wooden seat there were four telescreens, one in each wall. There was a dull aching in his belly. It had been there ever since they had bundled him into the closed van and driven him away, but he was also hungry with a gnawing, unwholesome kind of hunger. It might be twenty-four hours since he had eaten, it might be thirty-six. He still did not know, probably never would know, whether it would be it had been morning or evening when they had arrested him since he was arrested since he was arrested he had not been fed he sat as still as he could on the narrow bench with his hands crossed on his knee he had already learned to sit still if you made unexpected movements they yelled at you from the telescreen but the craving for food was growing upon him what he longed for above all was a piece of bread he had an idea that there were a few breadcrumbs in the pocket of his overalls it was even possible he thought this because from time to time something seemed to tickle his leg that there might be a sizable bit of crust there in the end the temptation to find out overcame his fear he slipped a hand into his pocket smith yelled a voice from the telescreen 6079 smith w hands out of out of pockets in the cells he sat still again his hands crossed on his knee before being brought here he had been taken to another place which must have been an ordinary prison or a temporary lockup used by the patrols 
He did not know how long he had been there, some hours at any rate. With no clocks and no daylight, it was hard to gauge the time. It was a noisy, evil-smelling place. It had put him into a cell similar to the one he was in now, but filthily dirty and at all times crowded by ten or fifteen people. The majority of them were common criminals, but there were a few political prisoners among them. He had sat silent against the wall, jostled by dirty bodies, too preoccupied by fear and the pain in his belly to take much interest in his surroundings, but still noticing the astonishing indifference and demeanor between the party prisoners and the others. The party prisoners were always silent and terrified, but the ordinary criminals seemed to care nothing for anybody. They yelled insults at the guards, fought back fiercely when their belongings were impounded, wrote obscene words on the floor, ate smuggled food with which they produced from mysterious hiding places in their clothes, and even shouted down the telescreen when it tried to restore order. On the other hand, some of them seemed to be on good terms with the guards, called them by nicknames, and tried to wheedle cigarettes through the spy hole in the door. The guards, too, treated the common criminals with a certain forbearance, even when they had to handle them roughly. There was much talk about the forced labor camps to which most of the prisoners expected to be sent. It was all right in the camps, he gathered, so long as you had good contacts and knew the ropes. There were bribery, favoritism, and racketeering of every kind. There were homosexuality and prostitution. There was even illicit alcohol distilled from potatoes. The positions of trust were given only to the common criminals, especially the gangsters and the murderers, who formed a sort of aristocracy. All the dirty jobs were done by the politicals. There was a constant come and go of prisoners of every description, drug peddlers, thieves, bandits, black marketeers, drunks, prostitutes. Some of the drunks were so violent that the other prisoners had to combine to suppress them. An enormous wreck of a woman aged about 60, with great tumbling breasts and thick coils of white hair, which had come down in, their, in her struggles, was carried in, kicking and shouting, by four guards who had, who had hold of her, one at each corner. They wrenched off the boots which, with which she had been trying to kick them and dumped her, dumped her down across Winston's lap, almost breaking his thigh bones. The, wom the woman hoisted herself bl uh, upright and followed them out with a yell of, F bastards. Then, noticing that she was sitting on something uneven, she slid off Winston's knees, knees onto the bench. Beg pardon, dearie, she said. I wouldn't have sat on you, only the buggers put me there. They don't, uh, they don't know how to treat a lady, do they? She paused, patted her breast, and belched. Pardon, she said. I ain't myself quite. She leant forward and vomited copiously on the floor. That's better, she said, leaning back with, with closed eyes. Never keep it down, that's what I say. Get it up while it's fresh on your stomach, like. She revived, turned to have another look at Winston, and seemed immediately to take a fancy to him. She put a vast arm round his shoulder and drew him toward her, breathing beer and vomit into his face. What's your name, dearie? she said. Smith, said Winston. Smith, said the woman. That's funny. My name's Smith, too. Why, she added sentimentally, I might be your mother. She might, thought Winston, be his mother. But she was about the right age. She was about the right age and physique, and it was probable that people changed somewhat after twenty years in a forced labor camp. No one else had spoken to him. To a surprising extent, the ordinary criminals ignored the party prisoners, the pullets, they called them, with a sort of uninterested contempt. The party prisoners seemed terrified of speaking to anybody, and above all of speaking to one another. Only once, when two party members, both women, were pressed close together on the bench, he overheard amid the din of voices a few hurriedly whispered words, and in particular a reference to something called Room 101, which he did not understand. It might be two or three hours ago that they had brought him here. The dull pain in his belly never went away, but sometimes it grew better and sometimes worse, and his thoughts expanded or contracted accordingly. When it grew worse, he thought only of the pain itself and of the desire for food. When it grew better, panic took hold of him. There were moments when he foresaw the things that would happen to him 
with such actuality that his heart galloped and his breath stopped. He felt the smash of truncheons on his elbows and iron-shod boots on shins. He saw himself groveling on the floor, screaming for mercy through broken teeth. He hardly thought of Julia. He could not fix his mind on her. He loved her and would not betray her, but that was only a fact known as he knew the rules of arithmetic. He felt no love for her, and he hardly even wondered what was happening to her. He thought oftener of O'Brien with a flickering hope. O'Brien must know that he had been arrested. The Brotherhood, he, said, he had said, never tried to save its members. But there was the razor blade. They would send the razor blade if they could. There would be perhaps five seconds before the guards could rush into the cell. The blade would bite into, into him with a sort of burning coldness, and even the fingers that he held it, uh, and even the fingers that he that held it, would be cut to the bone. Everything came back to his sick body, which shrank trembling from the smallest pain. He was not certain that he would use the razor blade, even if he got the chance. It was more natural to exist from moment to moment, accepting another ten minutes' life, even with the certainty that there was torture at the end of it. Sometimes he tried to calculate the number of porcelain bricks in the walls of the cell. It should have been easy, but he always lost count at some point or another. More often, he wondered where he was and what time of day it was. At one moment, he felt certain that it was broad daylight outside, and at the next, equally certain that it was pitch darkness. In this place, he knew instinctively the lights would never be turned out. It was the place with no darkness. He saw now why O'Brien had seemed to recognize the illusion. In the Ministry of Love, there were no windows. His cell might be at the heart of the building or against its outer wall. It might be ten floors below ground or thirty above it. He moved himself mentally from place to place and tried to determine by the feeling of his body whether he was perched high in the air or buried deep underground. There was a sound of marching boots outside. The steel door opened with a clang. A young officer, a trim black uniformed figure who seemed to glitter all over with polished leather and, whole, and whose pale, straight-featured face was like a wax mask, stepped smartly through the doorway. He motioned to the guards outside to bring in the prisoner they were leading. The poet Ampleforth shambled into the cell. The door clanged shut again. Ampleforth made one or two uncertain movements from side to side as though having some idea that there was another door to go out of, and then began to wander up and down the cell. He had not yet noticed Winston's presence. His troubled eyes were gazing at the wall about a meter above the level of Winston's head. He was shoeless. Large, dirty toes were sticking out of the holes in his socks. He was also several days away from a shave. A scrubby beard covered his face to the cheekbones, giving him an air of ruffianism that went oddly with his large, weak frame and nervous movements. Winston roused himself a little from his lethargy. He must speak to Ampleforth and risk the yell from the telescreen. He was even conceivable that Ampleforth was the bearer of the razor blade. Ampleforth, he said. There was no yell from the telescreen. Ampleforth paused, mind, mildly startled. His eyes focused themselves slowly on Winston. Ah, oh, Smith, he said, you too. What are you here for? To tell you the truth, he sat down awkwardly on the bench opposite Winston. There is only one offense, is there not? He said. And have you committed it? Apparently I have. He put a hand to his forehead and pressed his temples for a moment as though trying to remember something. These things happen, he began vaguely. I have been able to recall one instance, a possible instance. It was an indiscretion, undoubtedly. We were producing a definitive edition of the poems of Kipling. I allowed the word God to remain at the end of a line. I could not help it. He added almost indignantly, raising his face to look at Winston. It was impossible to change the line. The room, the rhyme was rod. Do you realize that... There were there are only twelve rhymes to rod in the entire language. For days I had racked my brains. There was no other rhyme. The expression on his face changed. The annoyance passed out of it, and for a moment he looked almost pleased. A sort of intellectual warmth, the joy of the pedant whose 
who has found out some useless fact shown through the dirt and scrubby hair. Has it ever occurred to you, he said, that the whole history of English poetry has been determined by the fact that the English language lacks rhymes? No, that particular thought had never occurred to Winston, nor in the circumstances did it strike him as very important or interesting. Do you know what time of day it is? He said. Ampleforth looked startled again. I had hardly thought about it. They arrested me. It could be two days ago, perhaps three. His eyes flitted round the walls as though he half expected to find a window somewhere. There is no difference between night and day in this place. I do not see how one can calculate the time. They talked desultorily for some minutes, then, without apparent reason, a yell from the telescreen bade them be silent. Winston sat quietly, his hands crossed, ample forth, too large to sit in comfort on the narrow be bench, fidgeted from side to side, clasping his lank hands from first round one knee, then round the other. The telescreen barked at him to keep still. Time passed, twenty minutes, an hour. It was difficult to judge. Once more, there was a sound of boots outside. Winston's entrails contracted. Soon, very soon, perhaps in five minutes, perhaps now, the tramp of boots would mean that his own turn had come. The door opened. A cold-faced young officer stepped into the cell. With a brief movement of the hand, he indicated Ampleforth. Room 101, he said. Ampleforth marched clumsily out between the guards, his face vaguely perturbed but uncomprehending. What seemed like a long time passed, the pain in Winston's belly had, had revived. His mind sagged round and round on the same track, like a ball falling again and again into the same series of slots. He had only six thoughts, the pain in his belly, a piece of bread, the blood and the screaming, O'Brien, Julia, the razor blade. There was another spasm in his entrails, the heavy boots were approaching, as the door opened, the wave of air that it created brought in a powerful smell of cold sweat. Parsons walked into the cell. He was wearing khaki shorts and a sports shirt. This time, Winston was startled into self-forgetfulness. Self you here? He said. Parsons gave Winston a glance in which there was neither interest nor surprise, but only misery. He began walking jerkily up and down, evidently unable to keep still. Each time he straightened his pudgy knees, it was apparent that they were trembling. His eyes had a wide-open, staring look, as though he could not prevent himself from gazing at something in the middle distance. "'What are you in for?' said Winston. "'Thought crime,' said Parsons, almost blubbering. The tone of his voice implied at once a complete admission of his guilt and a sort of incredulous horror that such a word could be applied to himself. He paused opposite Winston and began eagerly appealing to him. You don't think they'll shoot me, do you, old chap? They don't shoot you if you haven't actually done anything. Only thoughts, which you can't help. I know they give you a, a fair hearing. Oh, I trust them for that. They'll know my record, won't they? You know what kind of chap I was. Not a bad chap in my way. Not brainy, of course, but keen. I tried to do my best for the party, didn't I? I'll get off with five years, don't you think? Or even ten years. A chap like me could make himself pretty useful in a labor camp. They wouldn't shoot me for going off the rails just once. Are you guilty? said Winston. Of course I'm guilty, cried Parsons with a servile glance at the telescreen. You don't think the party would arrest an innocent man, do you? His frog-like face grew calmer and even took on a slightly sanctimonious expression. Thought crime is a dreadful thing, old man, he said sententiously. It's insidious. It can get hold of you without your even knowing it. Do you know how it got hold of me? In my sleep. Yes, that's a fact. There I was, working away, trying to do my bit, never knew I had any bad stuff in my head at all. And then I started talking in my sleep. Do you know what they heard me saying? He, he sank his voice like someone who was obliged for medical reasons to utter an obscenity. Down with Big Brother. Yes, I said that. Said it over and over again, it, it seems. Between you and me, old man, I'm glad they got me before it went any further. 
Do you know what I'm going to say to them when I go up for, before the tribunal? Thank you, I'm going to say. Thank you for saving me before it was too late. Who denounced you, said Winston. It was my little daughter, said Parsons with a sort of doleful pride. She listened at the keyhole, heard what I was saying, and nipped off to the patrols the very next day. Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? I don't bear her any grudge for it. In fact, I'm proud of her. Shows I brought her up in the right spirit anyway. He made a few more jerky movements up and down, several times casting a longing glance at the lavatory pan. Then he suddenly ripped his own shorts, ripped down his shorts. Excuse me, old man, he said. I can't help it. It's the waiting. He plumped his large posterior onto the lavatory pan. Winston covered his face with his hands. Smith, yelled the voice from the telescreen. 6079 Smith W, uncover your face. No faces covered in the cells. Winston un uncovered his face. Parsons used the lavatory loudly and abundantly. It then turned out that the plug was defective and the cell stank abominably for hours afterward. Parsons was removed. More prisoners came and went mysteriously. One, a woman, was consigned to room 101 and Winston noticed seemed to sh uh, and and Winston noticed seemed to shrivel and turn a different color when she heard the words. A time came when if it had been morning when he was brought here it would be afternoon or if it had been afternoon then it would be midnight. There were six prisoners in the cell, men and women, all sat very still. Opposite Winston there sat a man with a chinless, toothy face exactly like that of some large harmless rodent. His face mottled his, his fat, mottled cheeks were so pouched at the bottom that it was difficult not to believe that he had little stores of food tucked away there. His pale gray eyes flitted timorously from face to face and turned quickly away again with, uh, when he caught anyone's eye. The door opened and another prisoner was brought in whose appearance sent a momentary chill through Winston. He was a commonplace, mean-looking man who might have been an engineer or technician or of some kind. But what was startling was the emaciation of his face. It was like a skull, because, if it, because of its thinness, the mouth and eyes looked disproportionately large, and the eyes seemed filled with a murderous, un, unappeasable hatred of somebody or something. The man sat down on the bench at a little distance from Winston. Winston did not look at him again, but the tormented, skull-like face was as vivid in his mind as though it had been straight in front of his eyes. Suddenly he realized what, what was the matter. The man was dying of starvation. The same thought seemed to occur almost si simultaneously to everyone in the cell. There was a very faint stirring all the way around the bench. The eyes of the chinless man kept flitting toward the skull-faced man, then turning guiltily away then being dragged back by an irresistible attraction. Presently, he began to fidget on his seat. At last, he stood up, waddled clumsily across the, the cell, dug down into the pocket of his overalls, and, with an abashed air, held out a grimy piece of bread to the skull-faced man. There was a furious, deafening roar from the telescreen. The chinless man jumped into his tracks, jumped in his tracks. The skull-faced man had quickly thrust his hands behind his back, as though demonstrating to all the world that he refused the gift. Bumstead, roared the, the voice. 2713 Bumstead J, let fall that piece of bread. The chinless man dropped the piece of bread on the floor. Remain standing where you are, said the voice. Face the door, make no movement. The chinless man obeyed. His large pouchy cheeks were quivering uncontrollably. The door clanged open. As the young officer entered and stepped aside, there emerged from behind him a sort of stumpy guard with enormous arms and shoulders. He, he took his stand opposite the chinless man and then, at a signal from the officer, let free a frightful blow with all the weight of his body behind it, full in the chinless man's mouth. The force of it seemed almost to knock him clear of the floor. His body was flung across the cell and fetched up against the base of the lavatory seat. For a moment he lay as though stunned, with dark blood oozing from his mouth and nose, very faint whimpering or squeaking, which seemed unconscious, came out of him. Then he rolled over and raised himself unsteadily on, on hands and knees, 
Amid a stream of blood and saliva, the two halves of a dental plate fell out of his mouth. The prisoners sat very still, their hands crossed on their knees. The chinless man climbed back into his place. Down one side of his face, the flesh was darkening. His mouth had swollen into a shapeless cherry-colored mass with a black hole in the middle of it. From time to time, a little blood dripped onto the breast of his overalls. His gray eyes still flitted from face to face, more guiltily than ever, as though he were trying to discover how much the others despised him for his humiliation. The door opened. With a small gesture, the, author, the officer indicated the skull-faced man. Room 101, he said. There was a gasp and a flurry at Winston's side. The man had actually flung himself on his knees on the floor with his hands clasped together. Comrade! Officer! he cried. You don't have to take me to that place. Haven't I told you everything already? What else is it you want to know? There's nothing I wouldn't confess. Nothing. Just tell me what it is and I'll confess it straight off. Write it down and I'll sign it. Anything. Not room 101. Room 101, said the officer. The man's face, already very pale, turned a color Winston would not have, not have believed possible. It was definitely, unmistakably, a shade of green. Do anything to me, he said. You've been starving me for weeks. Finish it off and let me die. Shoot me, hang me, sentence me to 25 years. Is there somebody else you want, uh, is, is there somebody else you want me to give away? Just say who it is and I'll tell you anything you want. I don't care who it is or what you do to them. I've got a wife and three children. The biggest of them isn't six years old. You can take the whole lot of them and cut their throats in front of my eyes and I'll stand by and watch it. But not room 101. Room 101, said the officer. The man looked frantically round at the, the other prisoners as though with some idea that he could put another victim in his own place. His eyes settled on the smashed face of the chinless man. He flung out a lean arm. That's the one you ought to be taking, not me, he, he shouted. You didn't hear what he was saying after they bashed his face. Give me a chance and I'll tell you every word of it. He's the one that's against the party, not me. The guards stepped forward. The man's voice rose to a shriek. You didn't hear him, he repeated. Something went wrong with the telescreen. He's the one you want. Take him, not me. The two sturdy guards had stooped to take him by the arms. But just at this moment, he flung himself across the floor of the cell and grabbed one of the iron legs that supported the bench. He had set up a wordless howling like an animal. The guards took hold of him to wrench him loose, but he clung on with astonishing strength. For perhaps 20 seconds, there were th they were hauling at him. The prisoners sat quiet, their hands crossed on their knees, looking straight in front of them. The howling stopped. The man had no breath left for anything except hanging on. There, then there was a different kind of cry. A kick from a guard's boot had broken the fingers of one of, of, one of his hands. They dragged him to his feet. Room 101, said the officer. The man was let out walking unsteadily, with head sunken, nursing his crushed hand, all the fight gone out of him. A long time passed. If it had been midnight when the skull-faced man was taken away, it was morning. If morning, it was afternoon. Winston was alone, and had been alone for hours. The pain of sitting on the narrow bench was such that often he got up and walked about, unreproved by the telescreen. The piece of bread still lay there with the chinless man where the chinless man had dropped it. At the beginning it needed a hard effort not to look at it, but presently hunger gave way to thirst. His mouth was sticky and evil tasting. The humming sound and the unvarying white light induced a sort of faintness, an empty feeling inside his head. He could get up because the ache in his bones was no longer bearable, and then would sit down again almost at once because he felt too dizzy to make sure of staying on his feet. Whenever his physical sensations were a little under control, the terror returned. Sometimes, with a fading hope, he thought of O'Brien and the razor blade. It was thinkable that the razor blade might arrive concealed in his food if he were ever fed. More dimly, he thought of Julia. Somewhere or other, she was suffering, perhaps far worse than he. She might be screaming with pain at this moment, he thought. If I could save Julia by doubling my own pain, would I do it? Yes, I would. But that was merely an intellectual decision. 
taken because he knew that he ought to take it. He did not feel it. In this place, you could not feel anything except pain and the foreknowledge of pain. Besides, was it possible when you were actually suffering it, suffering it to wish for any reason, whatever, that your own pain should increase? But that question was not answerable yet. The boots were approaching again. The door opened. O'Brien came in. Winston started to his feet. The shock of the sight had driven all caution out of him. For the first time in many years, he forgot the presence of the telescreen. They've got you too, he cried. They got me long ago, said O'Brien with a mild, almost regretful irony. He stepped aside. From behind him, there emerged a broad-chested guard with a long black truncheon in his hand. You knew this, Winston, said O'Brien. Don't deceive yourself. You did know it. You have always known. Yes, he saw now. He had always known it. But there was no time to think of that. All he had eyes for was the truncheon in the guard's hand. It might fall anywhere, on the crown, on the tip of the ear, on the upper arm, on the elbow. The elbow. He had slumped to his knees, almost paralyzed, clasping the stricken elbow with his other hand. Everything had exploded into yellow light. Inconceivable, inconceivable that one blow could cause such pain. The light cleared, and he could see the other two looking down at him. The guard was laughing at his contortions. One question, at any rate, was answered. Never, for any reason on earth, could you wish for an increase of pain. Of pain, you could wish only one thing, that it should stop. Nothing in the world was so bad as physical pain. In the face of pain, there are no heroes. No heroes, he thought, over and over as he writhed on the floor, clutching uselessly at his disabled left arm. All right. So, again, drawing close to the end, and things have changed drastically for Winston. Um, I want to go back really quick to the Steven Pinker quote. When people talk, they lay lines on each other, do a lot of role-playing, sidestep, shilly-shally, and engage in all manner of vagueness and innuendo, Yet at the same time, we profess to long for the pain of tr uh, for the plain truth. Such hypocrisy is a human universal. Tomorrow, we're going to have a discussion on that quote on the discussion board, um, and it will build to another assignment that we will do on Thursday after the next section of reading. So until then, I hope you have a good uh, good rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you back in the space.